This is Dr. Karen, and this is the Are They 18 Yet podcast, where I help parents raise independent, self-sufficient kids without sacrificing their own identity and sense of purpose. I'm here to share practical day-to-day solutions for raising kind, successful, well-adjusted human beings and actionable advice for supporting systemic changes so we can make this world a more inclusive, accepting place now and for future generations. Hey there, it's Dr. Karen, and welcome to episode 44 of Are They 18 Yet? In this episode, I am going to continue my discussion on how to build language skills in school-age children. If you are a therapist, a teacher, or a parent of a child or children in kindergarten through 12th grade, obviously you've probably thought a lot about how you can help them be successful in school and in life beyond school. And one of the most powerful ways that you can do that is to build their vocabulary skills. In school, kids are constantly expected to learn and apply new information And if they don't have a solid background knowledge, then sometimes learning new concepts on top of that can be even more challenging. So I wanted to talk a little bit about vocabulary today and give a couple tips and recommendations for anyone who is supporting kids of, again, between kindergarten all the way through 12th grade. And actually, you could apply this information even in younger kids. The reason I'm talking about K through 12 is because that is the area where we see a lot of issues come out because kids are focused more on school. And so many times if kids do have a weak vocabulary or they are having a hard time processing language for whatever reason, whether it be environmental or whether it be because of something neurological, that is where we often see some of those issues come up just because the demands placed on them in school, the language demands and the things that they're having to do become more difficult over the course of the time that they're in school. So we can definitely see issues with language come up earlier in the early years. Obviously things can come up then as well, but for many kids, we don't really see the impact until they hit the school age years. So obviously, if you're a person who is supporting kids, you probably want to know some ways that you can continue to support kids' language development. So I wanted to dive in and talk about vocabulary today because it is one of the most powerful things that we can do for our kids is to find ways that we can build their vocabulary. Now, I do get a lot of questions from readers about this particular topic. It... The the question varies depending on who's asking it. So if I get a question from a speech pathologist, for example, a lot of times they're asking me things like, what is normal? What is age appropriate across the school age years? It's a speech pathologist's job to build kids' language skills. And so a lot of times they want to know, in order to be able to identify the kids that are in need of their services, a lot of times they want to know, all right, what's normal? Because it's hard to tell what kids might be struggling or might need additional supports if we don't know what normal is. But there is a bit of an issue with that line of thinking, which I'll get to in a few minutes. But but really, a lot of times what people want to know is, is what, what words should I be teaching kids across the the time that they're in school and how should I be doing it and on the other hand for teachers I know teachers have specific curricular materials that they follow so a lot of times the question of what word should I be teaching is a little bit different for them I don't get as many of those questions from teachers a lot of times the question is more you know what do I do for kids who are struggling how do I know how to support them what kinds of things can I do to accommodate them and when should I make a referral those types of things and then for parents 
it's it's very different when parents ask questions because a lot of times it's more along the lines of just what am I supposed to be doing day in day out what should I do to make sure that my kids are successful so I am going to talk about what people can do from all of those perspectives today I'm also going to share a resource for those of you who want to learn a little bit more about the process that I teach for speech pathologists. Again, if you're a speech pathologist, you will find it really useful, but anyone else, teachers, parents, other professionals are welcome to check it out as well because I do think that it can be really helpful to know other people's role in the process so that we can all work together as a team. Before I get going in the discussion, I wanted to direct you to some resources if you want to learn a little bit more. So I do have the main podcast page, which is drkarendudekbrannon.com. But if you are interested in learning some more specifically about language and literacy, then I invite you to check out my website that primarily has been designed for speech pathologists who want to support kids and improve their language skills specifically across the K to 12 years and that website is drkarenspeech.com. There is a blog section with all kinds of different articles and topics there. So if you're somebody who is just wanting to get some information about how to build kids language skills, then definitely check out my blog. Again, that's drkarenspeech.com. Now, if you want something more specific, especially if you are a speech pathologist and you are looking for a framework for boosting vocabulary and specifically language processing skills that impact kids' ability to perform in school, then I invite you to sign up for my free online presentation where I walk you through my entire framework that I use for language therapy, but specifically it is focused around building vocabulary that supports processing. And it's not just about just naming and identifying words. I do get into the specifics of how to work syntax and morphology and all of those other things that kids need in order to be able to process language and continue to grow their vocabulary skills across the school age years. So to sign up for that free presentation, just go to Dr. Karen Speech backslash language and you'll be able to sign up and you'll get an in-depth explanation of the framework that I teach the SLPs that I mentor. Again, that's drkarenspeech.com backslash language. Okay, so let's get going on this discussion about vocabulary. So I'm going to go to the question that I often get from speech pathologists and that is what is normal and age appropriate when it comes to vocabulary across the school age years again they want to know this information because they are required to evaluate kids to determine who is in need of services and it's hard to determine who needs help if you don't know what normal is and i'm using the word normal with air quotes because (laughs) well you'll see in a minute so the problem with that is that while it is relevant to have kind of a a benchmark starting point to figure out all right what are we expecting what are the expectations because if we had nothing if we had no curricular standards then we would have a really hard time to tell if somebody is not on track and it would also make it really difficult for teachers to be able to plan their curriculum. Now of course the downside of that is that the normal range is so broad so when you're going to say this is the standard of course there's going to be a wide amount of variance but again even with a lot of those curricular standards, there is kind of a wide range of, okay, this is the average, but if you have kids who perform a little bit below or above that average, that might be totally fine. And yes, if they are way far away from the average or the average range, that is typically, you know, something that you'd wanna look into because there's a lot of reasons why that may happen, but that is to be expected that there is going to be some variance. 
But with language and vocabulary, the reason it's so challenging to be able to tell what words are age appropriate and, a, and relevant for kids at a certain age is because vocabulary knowledge is so dependent on environment and exposure. And there was a language researcher that did some seminal work back in the 70s, and his name is Walter Lobin, but he did a study on language development across the K-12 years and just looked at a group of kids. And one of his main conclusions from that study, he did find a handful of language skills that did have some linear growth that did tend to be indicative of overall language performance. One of those things was syntax development, so how well kids were able to use complex sentences in their oral language and their writing. So that was one thing that they did find. But for a lot of the other language skills that kids need when it comes to school, especially things like vocabulary, there just wasn't a clear, like, this is what kids should be doing at first grade and second grade and 12th grade. So one of the things that he concluded was that it's almost dangerous to create some kind of a developmental milestone chart to say this is what is normal at each age. And so that's why a lot of times if you were to do a Google search, for example, for language milestones, so let's say that you have a young child and you want to see if they're on track, a lot of times you can do a Google search and find some kind of a chart or an infographic on developmental milestones. So you might find milestones for physical growth, and a lot of times you will find those charts for language, but you'll notice that a lot of them are usually from zero to six when it comes to language, and then they kind of taper off and the information gets a little bit more um, confusing and a little bit vague as far as what should happen at each age after after about kindergarten first grade age and the reason is because again it's so variable and like Loban said that it does get kind of dangerous or misleading to say well this is what's expected at this this age as far as your child should know these words because depending on their background, depending on geographically where they are, that may or may not be the case. And so when you start doing that, sometimes it might look like there is a language issue when really it might be that the child is just not exposed to the same types of things because of their cultural background, their economic background, a number of things. And so that's why it does get very difficult. And for me specifically, because I am someone who provides information and frameworks for working on language, because you can look at neurologically how we process language. And, and that's why I tend to teach people frameworks and strategies for decision making. And yes, I do teach some specific strategies for facilitating language, but I do shy away from getting things that are so narrow and rigid that say this is exactly what you should do at each age because again i am providing information for people all over the world yes primarily you know i think a, a large portion of my audience is in the u.s but i do have some people from other countries but also, even if I am just serving people in the U.S., that's, there's, there's, again, so much variability there. So I am very hesitant to tell people what is or isn't age appropriate. Rather, I would teach them more of a framework for decision making. So I, I hope that what I share today does help you to think through this as far as how to how to build your kids vocabulary and it is relevant to talk about specific words that is one way that we build word knowledge is to have discussions with kids especially when we're reading which is something that I talk a lot I highly recommend that you read with your kids and have discussions with them about what they're reading and interesting concepts that come up in the book and so obviously it is relevant to think about all right, what kinds of words should we talk about when we do that? So so today I wanted to share a couple things to think about when you're doing that. 
So one of the things that I'll start with is just the average number of words that school age kids learn every year and every day. And this was really interesting. This is what I discovered during my doctoral research, but the average school age student can learn anywhere between 3,000 and 5,000 words per year. Now, uh, that means that they learn 8 to 12 words per day. So when you think about those numbers, you know, it it's pretty, pretty interesting and, and also kind of amazing that that happens. Because remember, kids, they're growing, their brains are like little sponges soaking up new information. And when they're exposed to new words, they gradually learn more information about that word over time. So they might hear a word, they get some context, and they attach some meaning to that word when they're exposed to it. So maybe they're in school and they hear about a new word during some classroom discussion. Maybe they are on vacation with their family and they have some type of new experience. Maybe they're reading a book on their own and they learn some new words that way. That's actually one way that school age kids learn a lot of new information is through book reading. And the reason is because when we're having conversational language, a lot of times the language that we use in conversation is kind of the same vocabulary over and over again. If you think about your daily routine, you know, how how much variety is really in it? Well, you know, just day to day during your routines, there's not as much variability as, for example, reading a book that might have some totally new experience being described. So kids do learn a lot of language and texts. And then also the language in books tends to be more complex than conversational language. You know, in conversation, we're informal, but textbooks, especially nonfiction texts, do have a lot more vocabulary that that tends to be more sophisticated so kids do learn a lot of information that way and that's why the amount of words that kids can learn while they're in school is so much that's why they can learn up to 5,000 new words per year now they might not learn that number of words every year but that's just the range so I've seen depending on what source you're looking at some of them say 2,000 to 3,000 some of them say 5,000 so there's kind of the range there but really the main thing is is that kids are learning a lot of new information during those years so um, when it comes to kids who tend to struggle and again there are a lot of different reasons why kids might struggle. It might be because of their environment, depending on what their home environment is like. It might be because there is something neurological going on that is impacting their ability to process language. There are a number of different reasons. Maybe there is some kind of medical situation. So, you know, again, it, it's hard to always pinpoint the exact cause. Environment does play a huge role. So you, as somebody who is supporting a kid, can definitely have an impact. And really, it comes down to the, the amount of exposure to vocabulary they have, in addition to some of those genetic factors. But students with weak vocabularies often might only learn 300 to 900 new words per year, which comes to one to three per day. So it's significantly different. So you can see if you have someone who is is struggling, they tend to, the gap tends to widen over time and that's why it's so important to provide intervention. And again, like I said, these are kind of the, the averages. Remember that there is such a huge range of what can happen, but this is just some numbers to just kind of help you see what's going on. Another thing to keep in mind is that a lot of times kids who are having a hard time reading or don't like reading or don't have a lot of exposure to books, well, sometimes they are avoiding that because it's difficult. They, If they are 
not as developed in their vocabulary skills and sometimes that can result in comprehension deficits and that means that it's harder to understand what they're reading so it's not as interesting so they don't want to do it because it's hard but then since they're not reading they're not getting that opportunity for exposure so that's why there is that Matthew effect with vocabulary where it's kind of like the rich get richer the poor get poorer so it is really important to provide those opportunities as much as possible to get that exposure to language. And again, as I've said before, one of the number one things that we can do is provide a lot of exposure to book language, not just devices, not just something reading to a child while they're distracted and doing something else, even though I do think audiobooks can be a good option, but actual exposure to text language, especially some kind of interactive format, you know, a, a parent, an older sibling, some kind of a peer buddy, someone who's working with them at school, reading with them, and and even just fostering a love of reading. That can make a big difference as well. But then the question becomes, okay, I'm reading with my kid. What words am I supposed to be emphasizing? And how do I know what is a good word to discuss with my kids? So I wanted to talk a little bit about the framework of tiers of vocabulary that was originally brought to my attention in the book Bringing Words to Life by Isabel Beck, Margaret McCune, and Linda Kukin. And this is a framework for organizing vocabulary words that helps teachers and it also can help other professionals like speech pathologists to figure out what words should be emphasized in English and language arts curriculums. So I'm going to explain this framework. I know that a lot of my SLP listeners might be familiar with it. If you are a reading teacher or a general education teacher, you might be familiar with it as well. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about how everyone can use this framework depending on whether you're a therapist, a teacher, or a parent. And again, then I'll talk about what you can do to get more information from here. So there are, according to this framework, there are three different types of words. So there's three tiers. So there's tier one, which are words that tend to be conversational, that most kids tend to know. They just kind of figure out what these words mean just by general exposure and basic conversation. So things that they might encounter in their day-to-day -day life, like, you know, words to describe clothing and animals and, you know, pencil and dog, like those types of words would be tier one words, words that just come up in conversation. So we don't really need to spend a lot of time emphasizing or teaching those words to kids because they already know them. They've already got them figured out for the most part. So unless you have a child who has pretty significant needs as far as communication, you know, if you have a child who is you know, participating in the, the regular curriculum with their peers, then then typically tier one words are, are things that they're able to catch on to. And again, I'm talking about for the majority, of course, there are unique outliers and things like that. So that's what tier one is. Tier two words are words that are difficult but they also occur frequently. So tier one words occur frequently and they're easy for kids. Tier two words occur frequently across multiple contexts, especially in school, and they're difficult. So this would be words like summarize, comprehend, things that they frequently encounter on their tests when they have to follow directions, even things that sometimes come up uh, one example is I had a group of students who were taking a math test and some of the kids didn't know some of the vocabulary that they needed in order to do some of the things on the test. So some of them didn't know what a thermometer was or some of them didn't know what the word measure was or they kind of knew what it was but they didn't know what it meant to actually do it. So they got the answers wrong. It wasn't necessarily that they didn't 
understand how to do math. It's just they didn't know what that vocabulary was. So again, this is why I say language can really impact kids across the board in school, even the classes that aren't explicitly focused on language. So those words that I gave, those examples, thermometer, measure, well, those are also words that would be relevant for a child to know just in their day-to-day -day life. And those are things that might happen frequently just in their daily environment and also especially when they're in school, some of those words might be things that they have to do over and over again on tests and things like that. And I actually have a handful of tier two word lists and examples on my website if you check out some of my vocabulary articles. But but again, the the thing to recognize here is that it's words that tend to be a little bit more advanced. I'm looking at a couple resources right now and some of the words that are coming up are things like investigate, negative, directions, discover, honesty. Let's see, what are some other ones here? Whimper, bashful, atmosphere, expensive. So again, some of these words, they are Again, they're they're more difficult than the words that kids would typically be saying in day-to-day -day conversation. And of course, tier two vocabulary does tend to get more advanced as kids get older, but those are just some examples for early elementary school. So again, you can see that some kids might not necessarily know what those words mean right away, and they don't use them as often, so they do need a little bit more explanation and exposure. So now let's talk about tier three. So tier one, again, they tend to be easier words and they occur frequently, but because they tend to be things that are easier, kids don't necessarily need you to explain them. Tier two words also occur frequently, but they are a little bit more difficult. So as far as being relevant to a kid's environment, they're definitely relevant, but but they do require that you need to explain them a little bit more. Now, tier three words are words that are difficult, but they don't necessarily occur frequently in the child's environment, and they tend to be a little bit less practical. So these would be things that are super specific to the content areas. Now, I know I gave a math example, but a lot of those words that I mentioned for math are things that would be relevant in your day-to-day -day life, but... Some of the words that come up in science, for example, like I remember when I was working in the schools, some of the science vocabulary, I didn't even know what the words were, like a cnidarian, for example, which is like a little, you know, animal with tentacles or something like that. So words that are really specific to the topic area where you know, if you were somebody who had expertise in that area, you might know what they mean, but if you're not somebody who has that content knowledge, you wouldn't necessarily know the word. And so kids are expected to know some of this vocabulary for things like, like science tests, social studies tests, some of the other assessments that they might have to take or just some of the other subjects that they might need to participate in in school. But as you know, a lot of the things that you probably learned in school, maybe you're not applying them in your day-to-day -day life. So with tier three words, they do tend to be difficult. Yes, you know, kids often do end up studying them for the test, but as far as having practical use, especially when we're thinking about parents trying to figure out what should I teach my kids? Well, you know, if, you, if you're trying to think about words to emphasize when you are reading with your kids, the area that would be the most practical is tier two words. And so the philosophy that was presented in bringing words to life it wasn't necessarily that that they thought that schools should not be teaching the content areas like tier three words but they were thinking more along the lines of okay and in some of the other curriculums like reading and language arts and and things that we want to focus on some additional vocabulary development where can we best use our time well for those situations 
the type of words that they recommended were tier two words. The reason is because they're frequently occurring and they're difficult. Tier one, obviously, because they're not difficult. That one's less of a priority for the intensive instruction and attention. Tier three, yes, they're relevant when you're teaching the content areas, but beyond that, they're not as practical. So even though they're difficult, they just aren't as useful in day-to-day -day life. So the one that makes the most sense to prioritize is tier two words. And for my speech pathologists who are trying to think about what they should incorporate into their therapy, I often recommend that they do think about tier two words, but it doesn't make sense for them to be focusing on teaching all of the tier two words that kids might necessarily need at that grade level, they might want to prioritize just a couple of them that they think will be really useful and then focus their therapy more on teaching strategies. And again, I do talk about how to study words and teach kids to have more strategies for learning new words in my online presentation that I mentioned. So really, there's this balance between, okay, we do want to teach kids words directly. Teachers do that a lot. Speech pathologists can do that a lot in their sessions. But really, we also want to think about how we can help kids just pay attention to the language that they are seeing and figure out ways that they can, you know, figure out how to how to learn new words on their own because ultimately we want to give them a strategy for thinking about language and paying attention to language because that's what's going to help them to grow in the long run. Now, when it comes to what parents can do, because I do get that question a lot, I get that question from parents directly, and then I also get that question from my speech pathologist that I mentor as well because they want to work with parents and figure out, okay, what should I tell the parents to do at home? So like I said, I do have some frameworks for speech pathologists to follow in their therapy, but as far as what parents can do at home, again, as I've said before, if you wanna do one thing right away, it is make sure that you are reading with your kids on a regular basis. The thing that most schools recommend is the 20 to 30 minutes a day, like four to five times a week. Obviously it's better if you do it every day, but I know that sometimes teachers will say four to five times a week so that people take the weekends off or whatever. So it's more attainable for people because again, it's better to be consistent than try to overwhelm yourself. So just reading with kids alone is going to make a big difference. But if you wanted to get more specific and take it to the next level, then what you can do is not just read with your kids, but also pick out cool words that come up while you're reading and talk about what they mean. So again, some of those tier two examples that I gave, if you see a word that you think, oh, that's an interesting word, it's a little bit more advanced, I wonder if my child knows what that means. Maybe just stop and have a discussion about it. Like, oh, do you know what that word means? Or, oh, this was, this thing that happened was fascinating. What are some other things that are fascinating? And just have a brief conversation about the word. Sometimes you can explain what the word means. Sometimes you can just discuss it. Both of those things can be things that help your kids. And something else that you can do as well, you can do this while you're reading, but you can also do this just day to day, is just intentionally use more advanced words that you know that your kids may or may not know and just see if they're paying attention and, and just you know, use the words and use it as an example to see if your kids look at you and say, what, what does that mean? And then you can just have a conversation there. So think about ways you can incorporate it into your day. I am a fan of, you know, of course, I do recommend doing some specific exercises, but I'm even more of a fan of doing things that you can integrate into routines that you're already doing, because ultimately that can make things easier to stick with because parents are overwhelmed. You already have this other homework that you have to do with your kids. I don't like to give things above and beyond what people are already doing because people are, you know, things can be overwhelming as just in general when you have a school age child or children. So like I said, the reading and then just figuring out how I, how can I 
find opportunities in my day-to-day life to just expose my kids to interesting language. Obviously, you can do this through experiences, but you know, you don't have to travel to all kinds of places to do this. You can do this in your home environment. So, you know, you can even do it if you're watching a movie together. You know, again, of course, I recommend that you want to make sure you get the print exposure in addition to the device exposure, but there's nothing wrong with watching a movie and and that's a good time to have discussions as well when you're viewing different media and things like that. So, those are my recommendations. And again, if you are a professional and you do have some tier two word list examples, I know a lot of the professionals who are listening might already be familiar with that framework, helping parents to understand what that is. Because, you know, a lot of times, even though I do have some tier two word lists available, I use those word lists as an example and a starting point, not something that's like, you know, in first grade, kids have to learn all these words or else kind of a thing. So it's more of a starting point. And so going back to my initial conversation that I was having at the beginning about vocabulary growth being so variable, a lot of people will ask the question, what is normal vocabulary growth? What what are age appropriate vocabulary words? And what words should kids know at this grade or age or whatever? A better question to be asking is what words are kids being exposed to? And so the way that I help people who are trying to figure out what's relevant to to helping kids uh, for speech pathologists, I usually say, let's look at what kids are being exposed to in the curriculum. So look at the tier two words that are being used in some of the materials that they're reading in school and I would say the same thing to parents you know if you have access to some of the worksheets or resources or books that kids are reading in school that's a good place to look to to see all right what words are my kids expected to learn and you can take a look at some of the vocabulary words that kids are bringing home for homework and things like that so that's a good place to start if you are someone who is not a classroom teacher. Now, obviously, for the classroom teachers, it's a little bit different because they're the ones that are presenting the curriculum. They already have the word lists and curricular materials. So a lot of times their role is just, you know, communicating that and sharing that information with the other people so that they can know, you know, how to support kids in therapy or in the home environment. So that is how I recommend going about that. But the main thing is, is that if we want kids to be aware of and thinking about vocabulary, we have to do it ourselves. And so if you want kids to have that internal dialogue when they are learning new language concepts and kind of talk through and, you know, think about like, let's say they come to a word that they don't know in a book and they're trying to figure out what it means. Well, instead of just skipping through it and just you know, not understanding, what do we do? What can we do there? And and talking kids through that. A lot of kids might not have that internal dialogue and that problem solving and just to be able to talk through and think about, all right, well, here's something I don't know. What should I do about this? Again, that's an executive functioning skill. So this is one specific executive functioning skill that can help kids learn new words. Just that whole thought process when you come to a word that's unique that you don't know. So facilitating those discussions when you're reading with kids can be pretty powerful. But again, I, as I've said before, I err more towards having a strategy and just giving kids a new way to think about words. And yes, of course, we wanna think about what words that we're choosing, but I prefer to give people more of a framework for choosing words than telling them these are the words. You have to do these words, even though it is helpful to have some word lists and examples. So so this seems like a good place to wrap up, but I will be covering similar topics in upcoming episodes. So for those of you who want just general information about how to build kids language skills such as strategies 
related to tier two vocabulary, then I invite you to check out my blog. Again, my main site there is drkarenspeech.com, but you'll be able to see the blog section there. It's drkarenspeech.com backslash blog. But for those of you who want something more specific, especially if you're an SLP, and if you want to learn my evidence-based framework for language therapy that I use to essentially get kids to their least restrictive environment in school so that they are building the language skills that they need to support that high level processing that's so important in school that helps them to build their vocabulary, that helps them understand what they read, and just continue to make progress in school, then I invite you to sign up for my free online presentation where I share my five component framework for language therapy. This is essentially the framework that I created while I was working in the schools and getting my doctorate at the same time. So I was doing some research as far as just reading a ton of literature, doing some of my own studies, and then finally, trying it with the students that I was working with. So I was able to see some results in a real life setting, which sometimes can be a challenge when you're trying to make a connection between academic research and the real world. But since I was doing both, I was able to make that connection and stay in touch with what was going on in the trenches because I was in the trenches. So if you're interested in checking out that presentation, just go to drkarenspeech.com backslash language. Again, that's drkarenspeech.com backslash language. So as I've said before, it helps us out so much if you share this show with other people who might need it, specifically for this episode, because we're talking about vocabulary, it can be certainly relevant to a lot of different people. So if you are a parent, then definitely feel free to share it with your child's speech pathologist if they have one. If you are a speech pathologist, then definitely feel free to share it with your colleagues and the caregivers of your clients as well. And then of course, if you're a teacher, then feel free to share it with your colleagues and the caregivers of your students. Again, thank you so much for listening and I will see you in episode 45.